بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد I'm here to discuss some aspects of uh, leadership. Many years ago, I was uh, teaching at UCLA when I was in uh, America. Uh, I was there from 2002 to 2012. And from 2005 till I came back, I was an uh, associate lecturer and a teacher there during the night classes. And uh, I taught a particular type of class. Uh, this particular type of class was called the Islamic Sensitization Program. The purpose of this class was to sensitize people who were working in the Gulf, sensitize military individuals, private individuals, who are generally not Muslim, who are now going to work and do whatever employment the company sends them for uh, in predominantly Muslim countries. So you have people from the US, Canada, South America, working in Pakistan, India, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, parts of the Gulf. And companies felt it prudent at that time in a post-September 11th world that uh, we can't just send people there expecting to know everything. So what would something, what, what would be simple to us that why do Muslims remove their shoes before entering their house? We notice this here in many Muslim households that you move your, remove your shoes and you put it on a shoe rack with a special carpet for it. What's the significance for that? Why do Muslims eat with the right hand? What is the Adhan all about, for example? What was the history of the origin of the Adhan? So we put together this program here to introduce them to what our deen is all about. Alhamdulillah, through the medium of that, many people accepted Iman and Islam. At the onset, the university would tell us that this is not an Islamic invitation course. It is part of a paid program that corporates and companies are paying for and you are to introduce them to Islam, your faith in a factual way rather than in a biased way. That is your responsibility here. So myself and the co-lecturers, who are also Muslim by the way, said that fine, we will do exactly that. But what we will do is that we will add another dimension to the discussion is that we will correct our niyat and our intention before we come there. So whilst I may be speaking about the facts of wudu, the fact that I'm there with the intention that of Allah that people must be impressed not by my lesson, they must not leave here with merely facts, but they must also leave here with some form of guidance an unwritten, unspoken intention in the heart. Alhamdulillah, many uh, professors and teachers who still, that program is still running by you in UCLA would attest that people who would otherwise not be introduced to Deen not only left that six weeks program with an understanding of what Islam is all about, but uh, beyond an impression and hidayat and guidance only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day. Part of that program was to introduce these uh, individuals to Muslim personalities. So there are many Muslim personalities, of course, in, the, in, the, in, in prior history, we have the ultimate personality of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa his sahaba radiallahu anhu, but also to acquaint them with contemporary Muslim personalities. And uh, whether it was maybe the founder of Pakistan, for example, what was his idea? What was his vision? Allah Ibad, Rahmatullah Ali, for example, who was a poet, who was a visionary, in his own way a politician, but a philosopher in the sense that he motivated many people to higher ideals. One individual that, alhamdulillah, I think all those who prepared that course were unanimous upon that you cannot come to our class without learning about this person, noting that you are serving in the oil-rich parts of the world. Many of them, that was their jobs. They would go on and serve in Libya, North Africa, Algeria, for Aramco and these various companies. Is a person who is unfortunately less heard about in our circles, but should be spoken about more. And that is Umar al-Mukhtar, rahmatullah If ever there is a person who impressed me reading about him, who I never get tired of reading about him, the fact that he lived, you know, just a hundred or so years ago. His execution, his martyrdom was in the late 1930s. 
which meant that he is regarded as a person of our era, of our time. He wasn't of ancient medieval history. He used and he was part of modern weaponry and modern warfare. And when introducing him to that class, and I myself, you know, as a teacher, the person who benefits the most from any class is the teacher themselves. Because they are forced to study and they open up books and that wasn't the time of the internet. The internet was starting in the early 2000s, but it wasn't as, uh, you know, as, as robust and fast as it was today. So you still have to go to a library. You still have to make a phone call to professors and of, of Islamic history in particular who were in Lucknow, in India, who were maybe in Cairo. Speak to them, communicate with them, send us information. They would fax you information instead of a simple um, you know, scan and copy today. And then you would now accumulate that over time. And every time I read about him, and every time either somebody from Morocco, a colleague from Algeria, a colleague from Spain, would send me more information and more documents in Italy. Because remember, he fought against the Italians. More, much of his work was fighting against the fascist government of Mussolini. And as a result, he became a case study in Italy to a point that people have made uh, wings of the university in Rome, in Rome University has got a wing dedicated to Omar al Mukhtar, even though they executed him. Mussolini executed him. The, the Italians executed him, but later on, realizing his exemplary character and leadership, well, you could say it was a different generation, they named the wing after him, and case studies done in the name of this man. It's not so much about the man, right? The man is the man. He will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what we are speaking here today are, num are a number of his principles that he adopted in a time where Muslims were very downtrodden. And if I can move on to the next, who was Umar al-Mukhtar? That's the right one that I wanted to be on. He was a man born in the 1860s, right? In the latter part of the, the, the 19th century. But he lived at a time where Islam politically was at a decline. It was the end of the Ottoman Empire, end of the Khilafah. And at that time when he was born and he was growing up in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, the Uthmanin, or we famously, famously consider and, and talk about the Ottomans, their dominion extended not only in present-day Turkey, but their political influence was in Bulgaria, right up to Greece. Much of Central or Eastern Europe had Ottoman influence inside there, even though they did not control the lands of the Indian subcontinent. But the Mughals at that point in time, although they were disposed, people looked up to the Ottomans as the custodians of the Khilafah of the Ummah. North Africa or the areas of North Africa that were highly populated were under their control and dominion, especially where Umar al Mukhtar came from, which is modern day Libya, then known as Cyrenica. Now he grew up under this influence. He saw the Muslim Khilafah. He also saw nationalism. The people would come to him in the 1880s and 1890s and tell him, hey, these Uthmaniyins and these Ottomans are Turks. We are Arabs or we are Berbers. Right? They were genuine Arab in the sense that uh, it did not come from Hijaz, but they were North African, which meant that they were Amazigh. And a, a term used for them is Berber. They spoke the Arabic language, but of descendancy, they were Amazigh or Berber. And they would come with all these nationalistic ideologies in the 1880s and 90s to Umar al Mukhtar, who was in his 30s. He was a Quran teacher, and he was a very famous Quran teacher. He used to use the law and the slate to make you know, kids memorize Quran, a system that is still used in many parts of the world today. And, they would, and what he would do is that he would make them write in a, and it's not unique to him, he would make them write in a mix of saffron and charcoal. And they would write down their lesson. And the entire class would be on one page. This is everybody's page today. The only time we move from this low and from this page is when this unit here has collectively memorized it. And after memorizing it, they would dissolve it in water and they would drink it because it's a mixture of what? Saffron and, and coal. It just has a, you know, in fact, it might even be healthy for you. And they would drink it up and he would say that now the Quran is in your system. What you learned in your head is now flowing through you. 
He was a very righteous man. And as I, you know, it's important that we give him a proper introduction. And people would come to him with nationalistic ideologies, fight against the Turk, fight against the Ottoman. We need to establish an Arab, you know, government, a Berber government. He would say, Kalimatu Tawheed Yuwahiduna. It is one kalima that unites us, me the Berber, the Arab from Hijaz, the Turk that's coming from Istanbul, from Constantinople. As long as this remains and the Khalif remains, we will hold on to the ropes of Islam that as for the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ That you will hold on to the rope of Allah. 1911, that is when the Khilafah was disposed. The actual office re lasted right up until 1924. But the office of the Khilafah, 1911, just before World War I, out, the, the outbreak of World War I, that's when a secularistic government came to Turkey. They immediately put an end to the Khilafah. The offices of the Khilafah were seriously curtailed. Many Muslim communities of the world were confused. Even the subcontinent. You had, you know, pro-Khilafah movements coming up. No, we need to restore Muslim rulership. We need to restore Istanbul, Constantinople. Others, leave alone being confused, were now open to attack from other parts of the world. And in 1911, the Italian forces invaded Libya. They landed in Tripoli. They landed in Sirte. They landed in Benghazi especially. The bulk of the population of Tripoli, of, of Libya, was living in Benghazi at that point in time. And they landed their forces with one reason, that we want to reclaim the Roman Empire. Mussolini was at his beginning stages at that time. And he was regarded as a fascist president. And his motto was, and he would have on his coat of arms, all coins of Rome that used to be used in North Africa for ultimately their kingdom at one point in time, their dominion extended there. And he incorporated it in his coat of arms, telling the local population that weren't we here first, before the Muslims, before the Turks, before even you people, the Berber, before the Arab speaking language, we were here first. As a result, we are reclaiming our destiny of 400, 500 years of the great Roman Empire and we're landing on your shores. When this happened, they came back to Umar al-Khattab or Umar al-Muhtar and they told Umar al-Muhtar, Khilafah is no more. If we are no longer being represented by the Khalif, they in Istanbul, it is these pe people. He responded by saying, Al-An, now is the time. Now is the time for all of us to leave whatever we are doing and collectively wage war against them. And right up until the time of the noose around his neck, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raju, which will come to very shortly, he from the age of 53 waged an ongoing jihad and campaign against the Italian forces. But what we are here to discuss today, as I said, is not merely a history lesson. But what we could imbibe and inculcate and what we could draw from the leadership principles that he employed in the sense that we are not discussing those, lead those leadership principles from a person who is foreign to us, who does not share our deed, but a righteous individual who not only led his troop from the front, but was an example of of piety, of righteousness, was an example of salah, was an example of imamat, was an example of all those things which we as Muslims a hundred years later can absolutely relate to. The first principle that is now, that now makes it different was distinguished character, that they all knew him as a good and righteous person before his campaign started. This is very important. I mean, if you look at Risalat and Prophethood, not only the Risalat and Prophethood of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every Nabi for that matter, was a distinguished individual before they began their work. It doesn't mean that if a person has now turned over a new leaf 
and had a past and that past was not righteous or good in terms of our deed, that person cannot become a leader and cannot prove their character later on. Ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates opportunities for everybody, but it helps. It helps when the individual has been noted by friend and foe as a distinguished individual. The day he stood up in the market of Ben Ghazi and in code in the original Berber language, which the Italians were still grappling with, they knew Arabic very well because before they landed, they didn't just land like that, they were smart. They were already associated and communicated with the elite of the community. And you know what? It's no more Ottoman rule. We are coming, but don't worry. We're going to keep the elite in their respective positions. That we are now going to be the rulers of your land. But you know what? If you are a tax collector, don't worry about it. You'll continue to be a tax collector. If you're a slave driver, you'll continue to be a slave driver under us. We're not landing every Italian to our shore. So just be patient with us. Years before 1911, they started that communication already with the elite of society. The elite spoke Arabic. They did not speak Amazigh or Berber. He stood up and spoke to the masses and mentioned in code Berber that you know what, we are ready to fight against these people. When he did so and when he, when he spoke, people even though may not have taken a direct message but the distinguished character of the man who now stood up and said that we are not going to tolerate fascism and anything anti our deen in this part of the world resonated with them. Because character resonates before words. Character makes a bolder statement than anybody's words that they would do from the member, from the front, from the battlefield. You speak with distinguished character that's acknowledged by people around you. Then Alhamdulillah, you are already there. This is what all of us need to strive for. And it's never too late. You're a classroom teacher. You're an imam. You are the leader of a household. You're the father. You're the mother of a particular household. Work on your character, not just to a point that it becomes acceptable, Muslim acceptable character, but rather make it distinguished, make it stand out. Look for the very best of what character demands as a Muslim, as a human being, and then you start your path of leadership and becoming a role model. The next thing that this individual, this man had, you know, that we, we need to, we need to encourage is lead by example. I lead by example. One thing was, one thing was very, very evident with Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh. There is only one account of a single Italian prisoner dying under his care and his custody. And that too, it seems by mistake, there was a crossfire, there was a prisoner exchange of some sort, and you know, the soldier, and he was regarded as a petty officer, mind you, which was brought up in his trial later on, years later, was killed in that crossfire. Other than that, records show that seven to nine thousand Italian prisoners or locals who joined the Italian army were imprisoned at some stage by the forces of the Muslims led by Umar al Khattab, Umar al Mukhtar, and not a single one of them was killed, not a single one of them ever complained of mistreatment. But if you look on the other side, then whenever one of the Berber or Muslim forces were arrested, it was a death sentence immediately. Even aiding them and helping them and giving them a loaf of bread, sort of like a scorched earth policy that the Italians implemented, especially in the last 20 years of that, of that struggle. Very similar to what you could call the Africana or the African population went through Anglo-Boer War 1 and 2. Scorched earth policy, you can't even give them a loaf of bread. Very similar to what the Muslims underwent in the last struggles against the British Empire in the subcontinent. Scorched earth policy was implemented across the board, across the entire country. And up to a quarter of the population either died directly at the hands of the colonial entity or they were put in concentration camps and died of starvation 
but not a single prisoner that has been brought to Umar al Mukhtar's trial in the hope that the judge, it was a kangaroo court anyway, not a single Italian or local prisoner, many locals had joined the Italians as bag carriers, as medics and what have you, that, that's you know quite common in societies that there are colonial entities that they recruit local people to do you know these type of, of manual labors not a single person ever gave testimony that i was mistreated i was mishandled and every prisoner was eventually released upon the payment of some form of ransom either by the government or by his family with the exception of one that died in that crossfire it's remarkable where would you even have a liberation movement now that could safely say that this is our record that we took in seven to nine thousand people in desert conditions as prisoners not a single one of them is complaining that we mistreated them in any way can any of the governments today modern prisons and modern systems that you have today could they ever say that we treated every one of our prisoners according to the best you know rule books and, and this wasn't a time of he wasn't subject to any Geneva Accords. He wasn't subject to it. He was regarded as a rebel, according to them. Yet he showed exemplary character. Why? Because he led by example. And this one famous conversation represents and summarizes it up. You know, many people focus upon, upon this here, that during one particular battle that was especially harsh against the Muslims, two Italian lieutenants were captured high-ranking individuals and they were identified as having participated in previous campaigns his followers wanted to execute them then and there because they wanted to extract revenge that we need to kill these people over here to make a point and then when one of them said that we are we should kill them they do it to us they do it to us when they capture us don't they put us to the sword or they hang us what did he respond they are not our teachers. We don't respond with tit for tat. We have got the prophetic example as our teachers, as our teacher. The prophetic example, what does it demand? That when Badr occurred and the worst of the worst were in prison with the Sahaba, عنه, they fed us wheat while they were now eating coarse bread and barley, which would be fit for animals, but they made sure that we have the very best quality of foods at our disposal. That they themselves were struggling for good drinking water. Walakin, you know, Askan, sweet water was given to us as prisoners and they didn't demand anything. The ransom was there or you accept Iman or you go back to Makkah al-Mukarramah. But the treatment of the prisoner, Umar al-Mukhtar said, that's our teacher. That's our teacher. So here, the highest ideals of leadership, especially Muslim leadership demands that if something happens, you refer it back to the original code, the prophetic code. How would the messenger have behaved? Easier said than done, mind you. Easier said than done. We don't have the temperament. We don't have the sabr. We don't have the, uh, you know, the, the, the nature, obviously, of that first generation. But this is what this point here lead by example which example whose example the prophetic example which he in our time is showing us let's move on know your friends from your enemies very important know your friends from your enemies ali radiallahu says ahbib habibaka hawlan ma asa ay yakuna baghibaka yawman ma wa aghbib baghibaka Love your friends, but love your friend in moderation. It is perhaps that the friend may turn out to be your enemy one day. Hate your enemy, but hate your enemy in moderation. Don't become a chronic hater. Hate him in moder or her in moderation. In other words, show your, en your, your dislike in moderation. It is possible that one day that same baghir, that same enemy of yours who you consider to be not your friend turns out to become your friend you don't know how life ends up he Omar al Mukhtar, came from one of the elite schools of libya run by the ottomans known as the sharifa or the sharaif academy he had many other students with him he might have been the top five percent of his class but every one of those who were his associates who were his friends 
bought into Italian rule. And you know, you may think, oh, colonial invader, who has got the brains to, you know, buy into their rule? It happened right here in South Africa. You have many people who are complacent, who are happy, you know what, we'll buy into the status quo. And there were those who rejected. Not everybody was on the same page. There were those who were, you know, assisting and, and they enjoyed certain benefits, whatever those benefits were, or were all likely worldly. That's the first thing that the Italians did. That those were the scholars of the community, those who were the leaders of the community, immediately started buying them, giving them top positions, so that don't rebel against us, we will give you your cut, your percentage, which many of them were very happy with. Whilst the battle was heating up, a childhood friend, an associate of Omar al Mukhtar, Sharif al Ghariani, he grew up with him, studied with him. They were competitors in class and they, at one stage, they were the best of friends. The Italians give him a car and tell him, you know what, go and find Omar al Mukhtar in the desert, in the bushes somewhere, park your vehicle. You won't be able to find him, they'll find you. They'll pick you up and they'll take you to him. And of course, he knows who you are. He tells him, then why are you such a fool? Your people are going to be in concentration camps. Your people are, in are going to be or they are in concentration camps. Have mercy on the old. Have mercy on the young, the next generation. Omar al Mukhtar tells him, Hal yu khalifuni? Any one of them in the concentration camp by the millions, have they ever been disloyal to me? They know where I'm hiding. They supply me food. They know my soldiers are coming and collecting ever so once in a while assistance that they can muster together. Have any one of them betrayed me? You know why they haven't betrayed me? Because they are with me even though they're bodily not here with me. They're in the camps over there. They know exactly my cause. They are willing and I'm willing to die for this jihad against these Italians, against these fascist people. He didn't understand. Sharif al Ghariani died as a person loyal to the Italians. But Omar al Mukhtar tells his people, he is my friend, he also was my friend. Referring to the fact he's still my acquaintance, I know him, I'm not going to chase him away, but he's not the same. As an indication, people may never stay the same. It is quite possible that you could associate with somebody who was the best of the best. A person who was on your page by way of so many things that you were in common with and good things for that matter. But over a period of time, 10, 15 years later, it may be somebody else that you are talking to. The identity may be the same. The face may be the same. The occupation may be the same. But the intention is up absolutely in the opposite direction to what it might, might have been before. So one lesson in leadership that he tells us, that know your friends from your enemies, and if I can put it the other way, your enemies from your friends, able to distinguish them quickly, and at the same time, the advice of Ali radiallahu an, moderation in how you show your affection with people, how you love them, how you do not love them, ultimately you do not know the end, at the end of the road, who is going to continue to be standing with you and who might be vo voting or who might be on the other side. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Let's move on. A strategy of simplicity. Whatever you do as a leader, keep your plan simple. Don't over, you know, complicate your plan for ultimately your mind may be working on a higher level. But who are you? Who are you willing to lead? You are willing to lead people from all walks of life. Isn't that the prophetic example? That when Sayyidina Mu'az was extending the salah in his masjid day in Quba, uh, keeping the Isha salah very longer than what it normally was, what does he tell him? Listen here Mu'az, when you read, read from these surahs or the direction was given, which we consider to be part of our fiqh today. Why? In a nutshell, the narration says that behind you is the old, is the weak, the people of need. In other words, that you, when it comes to anything collective, your strategy has to be understood. It has to be appreciated. And the only way it can be appreciated if it is simple. That a person comes to the house of Allah, 
knows that this salah is going to be within the range of five, six, seven, eight minutes, that it's not high on one day or long on one day and short on the other day. The strategy is the same, it's simple. This is exactly, this is exactly what was the strategy of Umar al Mukhtar, uh, which is summarized. I will not cease until I achieve one of the two highest levels, martyrdom or victory. Simple. Martyrdom or victory. There is no in-between gray area in my life. It is either martyrdom or victory. And I swear by him who knows what is in the hearts of man that my hands were not bound. He said this year, an hour or so before his execution. They were so fearful of him that although he was 73 years of age and they captured him when he fell off his horse in that last battle. I, I can't possibly go into the history right now, but his party had split and he was thrown from his horse and with all likelihood, x-rays that were done later after he had already was already hung proved that he had broken his right femur and he was hobbling around at 73. The last salah that he performed before his execution was with his right leg stretched out because he couldn't bend it any longer. But they were so fearful of him that they would keep him bound right up until the last moment before his execution. And the, 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 the governor, the, gov the Italian governor, Graziani, who was the last governor of Italy, mentioned that the reason why we kept him tied up is because we thought this man is God. Because we thought this man is God and we only had to bound him up because we didn't want God to escape. Now, obviously he's not Allah, obviously he's not God. But such was it in their heads that he comes, he disappears, he comes with an army. His strategy is simple. We can never ever catch this man for years now. Faith would have it. Taqdeer would have it that he has now fallen in battle at the age of 73. But we were still, still so fearful of, of him to a point that we left him all alone on, by the hangman's noose. An hour after he passed away, nobody wanted to come and touch him because of the fear this guy will get up and he will do something to us. This is rob and the, and the awe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the enemies of deen, which is something else. Right, which is something else that can only be seen and appreciated at that point in time. But what does he say when he's bound and in his last words? In his last words, he say that if my hands were not bound this moment, if you people didn't tie my hands, I would fight you with my bare, bare hands, old and broken, referring to his leg, old and broken as I am, it's good that you bound my hands. Because if it was unbound, I would fight you right now before the hangman's noose. This is a strategy of one-mindedness of simplicity. That yes, there may be obviously other complexities of battle, complexities of governance that will come there. But the overriding strategy for a Muslim, martyrdom or victory, Bring that from a leadership point of view. Your overriding strategy should always be simple. That I want the best. This is how I want the best. You may put in extra complexities later on. But what is understood to be strategy as simple as possible. Let's move on. Loyalty. Right? Loyalty to everybody who surrounds you. Be a loyal person. Do not be a fair weather friend. You know what a fair weather friend is? A fair weather friend is that when the things are going good, I'm with you. And when things are getting rough, I disappear and you'll find me when you find me. You know, Mona Kalam Azad, he writes about the battle of Uhud, referring to loyalty and being a fair weather friend. He says that the hikmah and the wisdom of Uhud was to distinguish those who were genuine as opposed to those who were fair weather friends. Because when Badr occurred a while later, many people who were otherwise not sincere Muslims decided to run to Rasulullah and say, hey, he just defeated the Quraysh. His star is rising. Let's invest inside him. Things are going to be so economically rosy because you know he's won the war, he's defeated the, the Quraysh. He's the person to now back. So those people didn't come with 
the intention necessarily of Iman and Islam. The most number of Munafiqeen rose after Badr and continued to rise right up until Tabuk. Why? Because they, whenever they saw the ascension of Rasulullah they equated it with something worldly. Then when, when Uhud occurs, and now the Muslims, we will not call it a defeat, but were tested in their particular way, those very same people disappeared. Those very same people kept quiet. They took a back seat. And that was good for every movement, including the movement of Islam in those days, because now you are surrounded by those people who are genuine and sincere, and all the fair weather friends had disappeared for that. And they may come out of the woodwork a little later on, but currently, right now, they are not here as spoilers any longer. You are surrounded by those who are willing to die for your cause. He made sure of the loyalty of the people behind him. It's very simple, I mean, it's, well, it's not very simple to now show loyalty from disloyalty, but it is an important skill that every leader needs to develop that who are those who are the closest that will carry on, you know, picking up the, uh, the, the, the work after I left, who are those who are now uh, capable individuals and loyal to a cause that I currently have. He used to tell his his, his followers and this particular document and the speech that he gave was given to me by a historian by the name of Muhammad as uh, He's alive, he's in Libya today. He's a writer of tarikh and historical kitabs. Met him in Medina and the same request that I made that when we were teaching that course, he gave me this, this khutbah that he had given round about the middle of the campaign wherein he tells his followers that we'll never surrender. We'll win or die. You have to fight the next generation and the next and I'll live longer than my anger. This was 10 years before he was hanged. He used to tell them that you know what, if you fight and if you're loyal to the cause and if the other people learn from you the lesson of loyalty, I guarantee you that although I will be at the end of the hangman's noose, I will end up living longer than the hanger because of my ideology, because of my my will and my conviction, people will know my name, but ask them the name of the guy who hanged me. Ask them the governor who signed off on the letter. Ask them the judge. It's there in the historical books, but will people commemorate him? Will people remember him? They won't, but they'll remember me because of the loyalty that I surrounded myself and the generation after generation took up that cause. You know, who came from that particular area of Sirt? Uh, he hailed from that particular tribe, so all of them were put in concentration camps. One individual, and granted, you know, he's got many say, many may say a checkered past. He did a lot of good for the liberation struggle, and ever so once in a while, he deserves a good mention, Muammar al Gaddafi. He deserves whatever he did, whatever his standpoint at that point in time. Yes, he may have been a flamboyant individual, but he was a child in those camps. He was in those ch a child in those camps that continued throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s. You see, they, like many Palestinian refugee camps, although they re relocated them, after a while those camps became makeshift cities and continued in their particular way. And he would always mention that it was the people around me that would speak of Sidi Umar, Umar al-Mukhtar, that I never saw him. But there were millions of people who heard of his last days and were inspired to do whatever he did. Allah Ta'ala knows best. Nonetheless, that, that inspiration had come to do better for the people, to work for the people. And yes, the West will continue to taint the history of the past, slant it in their direction. And at the end, end of the day, ultimately, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best. But loyalty will breathe that inspiration. Continuing. Leave a legacy of leadership. Remember this year that although you may be a very good and inspiring Apa, Ustad, teacher in the class, your job does not end when you have finished deliver the goods. But the people who are, who's the next generation, who are going to come after you, have they learned leadership from you? 
Will they take up the mantle? Will that genuine legacy that you are hoping to aspire, which Alhamdulillah, many scholars have done so, many amongst the Ummah have done so, that they inspired a generation after them. It is your responsibility, not simply to be the best teacher, but also to pass on the baton and to leave a legacy of leadership that other people will follow after you. Now you may ask, how is this possible? Some people may do it in an informal way, simply through their charisma and their character. Other people, and I would suggest this, would keep notes, write down what was good and what good you did today. Not in the form of a diary, but in the form of a manual. That Alhamdulillah, I'm running this madrasa, I'm running this school, I'm a mu'allima, I'm a mu'allima in this class. Write down your notes. And if you're a good mu'allima, write down what made the lesson special. If you didn't make the lesson special, write down what would have made it better. Get into the habit of keeping some form of a journal regarding your personal work. And it's not something which is considered, you know, uh, less than yourself. Keeping a journal and being a constant critique of your own self is the ultimate uh, bequeath that you could give the next generation by way of a legacy of leadership. And look at me. I'm writing what was good, kindly copied, but I'm also writing where I flopped and where I failed. In this, with this intention and near, that when it comes to your turn to be in my position, you will not make that same mistake and you will be judged the conditions around you so that you will hopefully be a better leader than I am. And if every person in any source of authority does it, you will leave that manual and that journal not to a person who is an ardent follower, but a close student, right? The legacy is going to be picked up by who? Not just those who like the way you look or like the way you sound, but they intend to be a close student of yours. Let's continue. Accept the decree of Allah. Whatever happens at the end, whether you claim to have invested your time and your energy is the decree of Allah. You will be rewarded as per your intention but ultimately, the decree of Allah is something that will supersede and be more powerful than any one of us. Omar al-Mukhtar, and the reason why we're mentioning his name, Rahmatullah is because he is the subject of our study here this, uh, this afternoon. When he was about to be hanged, or rather in his trial, and the judge tells him that with you ends the revolution. With you ends the revolution. His response was, it is the decree of Allah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. With my death, the revolution begins. Right? With my death, the revolution. He was confident that the people who I left behind, who are youth and youngsters growing up in these concentration camps, are going to be inspired some way or the other by the work that I did. But ultimately, he, he says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Even when being offered, we will give you exile. Shall we give you exile to Egypt, which was at that point in time pro-British? Pro they offered him uh, exile to Hijaz, which at that point in time was also undergoing its own political change. Uh, in Lawrence of Arabia was now there at that point in time. In, 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 well, he had just concluded his, uh, you know, his tenure, but the Saudi royal household had offered him exile. Come and live with us. Italy even said, we will treat you as a VIP prisoner, you come to Rome. He says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, that I do not accept any offer, my decree is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whilst we may marvel at his bravery, more important than that is the actual lesson that he teaches every ummati, that at the end of the day, you accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your full trust in him. If a person does so, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ensure that that will hold weighty on his mizan or her mizan on the scales of the, on the, the scales of good deeds on the day of Tiyama and it will have something which is called athar, effect. You see, we think that effect is only when I'm loud. Effect is only when I write very well. Effect is only when I teach very well. Effect is only when I come inside that hall or that class with full bluster. Little do we realize that when the sun shines, 
when it makes us remove our jackets and our waistcoats, when it makes us, you know, feel hot under the arms, is it blowing through the door? It's merely having the most subtle of effects. In life also, accepting the decree of Allah has this effect. That it creates that change, but in the most subtle of ways for those who observe you, saying a genuine, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, that I accept the decree of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make whatever was said beneficial. These are only seven points, and there are many more that could be extracted from many great leaders of the ummah, those that have affected our life and those that have, alhamdulillah, that have made an impression upon us. And if it was successful or beneficial, alhamdulillah, then invite them in our own way. As they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. Leadership also is not created in a single day. It's there when one attaches themselves, diligently applies themselves to the rules and the codes of leadership. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He accepts a person, makes a person a leader without them even realizing it. Upon one point, I will conclude. Our Nabi sallallahu said, Sayyidul Qawm fi safar khadibuhu. The real leader of a nation, a community, is the servant. Servant leadership has been spoken about in South African politics for some time now. Has it delivered? Has it now manifested? Allah Ta'ala knows best. But servant leadership is from the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa And it is something that we all need to take seriously. You're a leader when you have ensured that I left the classroom with doors closed, windows closed, lights off, aircon off and in a tidy place. Even though I'm not the principal of this place, I'm not the janitor, I'm not the custodian, I'm not the caretaker, but I left it. Why? Because I'm a servant leader. I'm a servant leader. You are a servant leader when you have now seen a student, no matter what was the quality of that student, left their bag behind or even left their lunch tin behind and they're walking behind the door. You come behind them and say, you left this behind here, kindly take it. it it's not your job. It's not your job to be their mummy or their daddy and to now run behind them with an empty lunchbox. But you did so. Why? Because you're a servant leader inside that class. You may think it makes zero impression, but wallahi, years from now, when the concept of servant leadership is being discussed, or it is hopefully imbibed by the next generation, these are practical examples that will now become relevant to that very same generation that was affected by your servant leadership. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make whatever was said as I said beneficial. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa akhum wa alhamdulillahi wa barakatuh.